Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. Today we're going to be talking about Season 7 and the new update preview that has just been released. Season 7 is going to come out in about one week from this uh, video's release. And in Season 7 we're going to be seeing pretty big changes to both how Siege works, a couple of Civ changes as well. And then we're going to be seeing some new game modes and most important of all, as you'll see already here, crossplay. Because one of the first things that we're going to have to talk about here is going to be that we can now play with Xbox players. So the PC players and the Xbox players can join. They can play both team and it seems like they can also play solo ranked together. So that is pretty exciting. You can now join up with your friends over there. As well, we're going to be seeing a new uh, spring uh, tournament something event here it starts um, from May 21st and it's going to be introducing a couple of new cosmetics. You can take a look at this yourself. We're not particularly interested in this. What we are inter interested in seeing is the new map pool right here. The new map pool for the 1v1s will be Dry Arabia, it will be Cliffside, Rocky River, Forts Gorge, Highview, Danube River, Lipany, and Four Legs. And for the team ranked, we'll be seeing Dry Arabia, Cliffside, Rocky River, Prairie, Gorge, Hillendale, Lipany, Migration, and Waterholes. If you're not a super big fan of water, then you can uh, be pretty happy because these water maps here aren't really that... Um, focused i would say on the water part they're more focused on the land part so many of these maps especially if you're not playing at the highest level you'll be able to play with just uh land strategies this is pretty cool one of the maps that you do have to watch out for is going to be four legs and it's going to be danube river these two maps here you have to play water on the rest you're pretty good not playing water on so a big up for people who don't play water though you should probably learn it all right, and for the team ranked, well, we have uh, Migration and Waterholes. So these two you can ban, but then the rest of them are actually pretty good to play just land. So I think this is pretty good. Again, crossplay is now available on PC and console. So now we can join together. And we have also got another update here to the UI. So the user experience when it comes to the pop-ups that you see when you play is going to be changed now so now we are going to have out to the left corner of our screen the um monument timer we'll have uh let's say for different game modes and most importantly the sacred site timer so we can see which color is controlling the sacred sites and uh, how long there's left on them and hopefully this is also for the uh, casters ui and uh Okay, so quick match. New game modes. Pretty exciting. We're going to be having Nomad game mode added as a new option. And it comes with several improvements. We'll go through them. And then we're going to have a new free for all option, um, which allows you to queue for eight player free for all matches. So you now have two new types of queues together with Empire Wars and Standard uh, Quick Match. You can now play Nomad and you can play free for all in the queues. This is really, really cool because this is something the community has been asking for for quite a while now. There's going to be a new leaderboard for the free falls. And so what will happen is when you play uh, the free falls, of course, only one player can win. And so the loss of ELO is going to be split among uh, all of the players that are there equally. So I don't know if this means that if you are higher rated, you'll get a larger amount of ELO loss or lower. Uh, but it seems even split could mean that it's just going to be a flat split. Um, but we will have to wait and see how that's going to look. For Nomad, there'll be improvements. Instead of starting with only three bills, you'll have five. And their distance will be also greater. So there will be more possibilities to spawn your TC. Instead of, okay, I spawn in this corner. I can only be here. Now you're possibly going to be able to spawn and build your TC wherever you want to. Then for uh, the Hri, the Shushi's official and the Gurs, they are also granted upon the construction of the town center. Then it says that the English villager bows and Chinese villager build speed bonuses are deactivated at the start of the game, which means that Chinese is not as OP early on and that the villagers will not hunt down other villagers. So it seems there's going to be some nice balancing here. Really cool, I would say. Sean Dark starts with three villagers plus Sean Dark uh, instead of just the five villagers. And then Order of the Dragon starts with four villages, just to sort of even out because their villages are stronger. 
There's going to be a new Dominion win condition, and this is something you can be enabling in custom games. Um, it's compatible with standard Empire Wars Nomad, and it basically is where you have a monarch that you have to protect. If you lose the monarch, you instantly lose. Uh, so it's kind of like what we've been seeing in Outback Octagon. Um, in it, eliminating an enemy monarch grants 50 plus maximum population. And if the enemy is limited, uh, limited by a landmark victory, uh, their monarch remains in the field. So if you um, kill a neutral monarch, you get 50 plus maximum population there as well. So it's basically just Outback Octagon as a game mode. Pretty cool. Your monarchs have two abilities, so this was the king in the Outback Octagon, where you could temporarily move faster, and you can also reveal the location of enemy monarchs. So yeah, very nice. Quality of life improvements. So there's going to be some AI improvements here. This is for uh, different types of SIF-specific AIs, and also for uh, the easy AI, making it easier for players to play against them. So if you're a new player, this is good for you if you want to practice against the AI. As for audio, quick fix on some Sultan Ascent Chinese voiceovers. Let's take a look here. We have, in general, this is where it gets big. This is the big news. All right. Shoreline fish can no longer be permanently removed when placing structures on them and will automatically return when the building is deleted uh, or destroyed. This might not seem like a big deal to the average player, this is a big deal if you are playing in tournaments, because this is a rule in the tournaments that you cannot intentionally delete villagers from the um, shoreline. Sorry, not villagers, the shoreline fish from the shoreline, meaning, okay, if I build a dock and I accidentally delete a bunch of villagers, that's a problem. Now, that's not going to happen anymore, because that strategy is not going to work. The, the fish will respawn. We have another thing here, fixed an issue where, where villagers seeking shelter would sometimes fail to choose the nearest available outpost for shelter. This is also an issue, I think, in many games if you're using the garrison hotkey, because a lot of times seven or six villagers will run to an outpost of only five villager capacity. Hopefully that's fixed now. It seems that it is. The same is when you unload from a garrison, your villagers now exit um, on the side closest to their destination, right? So if they're going on berries and you have uh, garrisoned, now when you exit, they will now go out that direction again. So we might not need to do the teleport anymore. Then there's an exploit with some duplication of relics that they have fixed. I feel like they have fixed this like a hundred times over the past two years. So maybe, maybe it's fixed, who knows? Um, we have an issue where lightweight beams, so that's the RAM upgrade, uh, would not reduce construction time. Um, there's also some other stuff here. Uh, let's see, let's see. There's a big one here where the deer would get stuck together um, after colliding. And there's also another one with the deer that I can't find right now. But basically, the uh, blueprint is uh, now going to be a little bit easier to click, um, which is cool. Uh, so now that you can select the deers and the blueprint of, let's say you're building a TZ on deer camp, that's going to be easier. Uh, but I don't remember where that was stated. Anyways, let's uh, go on. We have a, another one here. When a player is defeated, the units will now fully seize their current actions when they turn neutral. A lot of times when you kill someone, their units have actions to maybe kill your units. And now you have a bunch of AI units that are running after you. That's now fixed, which has been a problem. I remember this back from the release days as well. This was an issue. It's, uh, it's about time that it's fixed, I would say. Monk's order to capture Sacred Site will now remain until it's captured before executing queued commands. This is a slight deli nerf, I would say, because now you can actually queue up your scholars back to your monasteries or other buildings. Uh, but it also, of course, would work for other civilizations. This is just nice for monk survivability. A lot of times we forget about the monks. No longer an issue. Fix the bug where villagers would idle instead of returning to work. If they were gathering from a boar, this one has been an issue for a long time, though it's something that I've gotten used to. So basically, if you have a tower on your boar, you're gathering boar villas, a boar from, your villagers will now, after you exit and press return to work, go back to the boar and just stand there. That's not going to happen anymore. That's cool. Something with explosive ship kills that are now counted in post-game statistics. And the post-game statistics now also currently correctly reflect units lost when a transport ship sinks. Then there's something with um, 
units inside a RAM or Siege Tower. So there was an exploit where you could put units inside a RAM or Siege Tower, put the Siege Tower inside of the transport ship, and now the units were invul invulnerable. There's some crashes fixed with a single player mission. There's a cheat that now also works uh, with the Ayubid Cavalry and Gulam units. So the Inner Jiffy is the instant construction one. We have, they have fixed a crash that could happen when playing on Canal. And then they have also some water borders, fixed an issue with forts where the wrong size of the map was used for team games. We'd have some weird spawns where there were so many cliffs that people couldn't access each other. So they couldn't get out of their base in the front. They had to go all the way around, which was a bit of a, an issue. They also fixed a crash with entering a match. A lot of times people would crash just from playing a game. They not even started the game. They just crash immediately. And then there's one here when switching control groups quickly while mousing over the command card. This was um, something that a Reddit user put up. And he basically found out that whenever Beastie crashed, or I think it was Beastie, Beastie did the same movement, which was he was something with his mouse down over the command card. And then he was switching control groups very quickly like he does in the early game. And then he crashed. That's fixed. Okay, there's some UI stuff here. For example, when you're hosting a custom game, sometimes you cannot invite your players uh, after the host leaves. So the new party host isn't really host. Um, that's no longer an issue. They have also um, fixed some codex items. They've added functionality for players to block chat communication and see who they have blocked. They have there's also now player stats on the quick match screen. I didn't know there wasn't. There's fixed an issue that prevented players from scrolling the games list page under certain circumstances. The Byzantine selection card background pattern is no longer missing. So yeah, these are some pretty, you know, cool changes, but minor stuff. As for the balance and the bug fixes, we now see a, another change to Siege. The RAM health has been increased for all civilizations from 340 to 370, and the build time has been decreased from 80 to 70. So now we have a lot stronger rams in the Fuel Age. They still cost 200 wood though. So pretty big buff to Fuel Age all ends. The workshop ram train time has been reduced from 40 to 35 seconds. And Mangonels and Nesta Bee's health have been reduced from 140 to 130. The bonus damage from Springles versus Siege has been increased from 60 to 65. This means that Springles now, once again, two shot Mangonels and Nesta Bee's. The Bombard and the Great Bombard and the Cannon Ranged Arm has been increased from 35 to 40. And uh, the previously, some garrisonable buildings, units, and transports displayed each garrison weapon as individual weapons. And that's been merged. They corrected some issues with elite army tactics and incendiaries that were not affecting all intended units. Stone earned from relics and pagodas reduced by 50% and food and wood has been increased in its place. So now it generates 100 gold, 62 food, 62 wood, 25 stone. So pagodas are still very, very strong with the Chinese, though not as good with the stone income. So keeps aren't really something you're going to be seeing as quickly. They've also cor corrected an issue when loaded battering rams were missing the unload garrison ability for HRE and OOTD. And they've corrected an issue when where merchant guilds could be researched twice for French and Sean Dark. Pretty cool. For the Civ specific changes, we now see Abbasid having their fresh foodstuffs tech moved to the mill instead of the town center. This means that when you want to research the technology that gives you cheaper bills, now you don't have to spend a villager doing that because now, or as of right now, you have to do it in your TC. If it's in the mill, you can keep making villagers. This is very cool because now we have more economy. This is an indirect, uh, quite direct buff actually to the Abbasid. The Camel Archers have also um, gotten their cost reduced, so they save 10 food. I th still think that these are quite too expensive. Uh, 160 would probably be a little bit better, but maybe we'll see more changes. The Fertile Crescent, which is the one that reduces cost of all production buildings in the Eco Wing, has now seen a discount um, increase from currently 25% to 30%, so even cheaper buildings. And the Spice Roads upgrade from the Trade Wing um, now correctly modifies gold income for all traders. So. Nice little bug, face, bug fix. For the Ayubids, we see the Tower of the Sultan. 
that no longer has RAM melee vulnerability, so that's a pretty big buff. Its build time is also reduced to almost, what is that, one-fourth, a little bit more. So 140 seconds instead of 200. And garrison units increase the movement speed. And that is pretty cool. So if you have a fully garrisoned Sultan, uh, Tower of the Sultan, it now moves a lot faster. So currently it's quite slow. So this is a, a big upgrade to the Tower of the Sultan. We're probably going to see that a bit more, though it's quite expensive still. Then we have Adabex. Supervision and biology are now multiplicative. I'm not sure what this means. We'll have to see. We have now also corrected an issue with Desert Rage range. Ranged weapon was not fully benefiting from the Golden Age 5 attack speed bonus. So another buff to the Desert Raiders in the late game. As for the Byzantines, the Cairo Siphons, which is their rams, um, are now reduced from currently 200 wood and 100 gold to 200 wood and 60 gold. So 40 resources uh, less. And this is really nice buff to, in general, wanting to do a ram push with the Byzantines. More feudal play instead of the currently quite a lot of castle play that we see. Their health has been increased to 310 and their Kyra Siphon uh, ranged armor is increased from 30 to 50. Kyra Siphon bonus damage versus walls has been increased to 5. So overall, pretty big buff to the Kyra Siphons. The first mercenary contract choice is now free and instant, and it saves 100 olive oil and 20 seconds of research time. This is cool because now we don't have that big of a um, cooldown on our mercenary. We can get them up and running a lot quicker, and this now makes Byzantines a lot faster. We can play them in the Feudal Age even more now instead of having to go castle. We have also seen a reduction cost uh, of the cost of veterancy upgrades on mercenaries. So now it's a, a half of the usual amount of resources. So 175 instead of the 350. And the cost, uh, the time to research is now 30 seconds instead of 60. The limit on a shield wall damage has also uh, been nerfed. So now instead of reducing 40%, uh, it's now 30. The manual emplacement damage has been reduced to 7 from 8. We have corrected an issue where mercenary supplies and mercenary camera riders would receive gold from Expilatoris. And the Greek fire projectiles now mentions that patches of Greek fire can't stack. Pretty cool. Let's move on to the Chinese. Small little change, but a pretty big one, I would say. So the Chinese, now it's an even better idea to build your farms around the Barbican because now the Barbican accepts tax drop-off. The Delhi Sultanate have gotten a small Ghazi Raider buff, so now they actually do bonus damage versus siege engines, and they also have the correct research time. So, yeah, nice little buff. For the English, we see the Berkshire Palace. Uh, weapons are no longer duplicated on their UI, correcting an issue where one garrison arrow was normal instead of incendiary. So, yeah, small little change there, Not, nothing too big. For the French, we see that the keeps now cost 10% less stone to build. So now urging on, even though they nerfed it last time, they now urging on the French to play with more keeps in the end game. The influence influence range have also been increased by one. So yeah, you better be building those archer ranges and stables around your keeps. The Holy Roman Empire has seen a pretty big change now. They're being buffed massively for the Feudal Age because now they start with marching drills, giving your units more movement speed. Though they did take away that effect on the prelates. You grant your it's now a sieve bonus, so you grant you're granted it for free. Instead, inspired warriors now increases the move speed of prelates, and the prelate inspiration range has been increased by one tile. This is pretty big stuff for the Atri in the early game. The Mindvac Palace bonus increase from 40 to 50% cost in research time, so that your techs in the Mindvac are now cheaper and even faster at researching. So Holy Roman Empire will now be a pretty um, fearsome feudal age uh, civilization, most likely. So in some matchups at the high level, the Holy Roman Empire are probably better off playing aggro and will probably have a pretty high success rate with it. So I look forward to seeing pro players experimenting with the HRE. As for the Japanese, the Castle of the Crow has uh, an issue corrected where projectiles would be blocked when attacked from certain, certain angles. And there's also some help text uh, explanation that now you get a reduction in the bonus stone 
uh, instead of food, gold, and wood. So the trade caravan that comes to your Castle of the Crow, the H4 castle landmark, is now um, properly displaying uh, in its help text. And they're also uh, doing something about Tobara, Takasaiku, and Fudasashi, so the economy upgrades. Um, the pips now appear. I'm not sure what this means, if it's the caster mode that's now fixed or what it is. As for Jean d'Arc, Jean has her help text for consecration updated uh, because they got a new technology. And the Mongols are going to see a pretty big nerf here as well. The Mongols are going to see a reduction in the stone income from their ovus in the Dark Age. So now you have to wait a little bit extra before you can do the double production of spears. I'm not quite sure how much this translates to with it being 70 instead of 80 per minute, but it's probably going to be a few seconds, uh, maybe 10. And uh, that's going to significantly reduce the impact of the um, of the spearmen that come out, the shock value of the spearmen of the Dark Age rush. Um, yeah, moving buildings, rotation rate is being reduced so they do not instantly snap when changing direction. The Karkinut Palace, Roos Knights now probably use Polaks. The Horse Archers have a Gallop ability. The Nestor Bees have additional barrels upgrade. The Prayer Tents no longer grant vision on pre-emplacement. And... Uh, fix an issue where units could get trapped in a Mongol landmark where, she owner, where when its owner was eliminated. So if you have been playing since release, you'll remember that if you killed, uh, destroyed a Mongol landmark and you stood on top of it, it would lock your units. Apparently this is still happening and hopefully it's fixed now. A crash relating to the Silver Tree landmark has been fixed. Haven't really noticed that. Um, and allies of a Mongol player can now set the Silver Tree as a trade destination. While it's packed up and traders will only move to it, while it's unpacked. So the allied traders behave the same way that Mongol traders would with the silver tree being packed. As for the Order of the Dragon, buff again. So the Aachen Chapel now gives you 15% instead of 10. Your Mindvac Palace bonus is the same now as the Atri, so 50 instead of 40% in the cost and research time. Your Golden Curias, the Manor Arms um, upgrade, is now increased from costing 50 food and 125 gold to 100 food and 200 gold. So that's a 50 uh, food and 100 gold discount. Uh, the Sonhau cost, so that's increased from uh, another 100 food to 250 gold to now 150 food, 350 gold. The Botkin Bowls has also been increased from 200 food, 500 gold to 300 food and 700 gold. So that's the same now as an Imperial uh, University upgrade. The uh, Gilded Hand Cannoneers uh, were missing some projectiles and muscle effects. Those have been fixed. As for the Ottomans, the Ottomans, which is the big baddie right now, <laughs> according to a lot of people, um, they have been nerfed as well. And more than you think, even though these are just four lines, this is quite big. So some people were complaining about Great Bombards. I don't think the problem so much is the Great Bombards, though they are definitely strong. The Ottomans are the biggest problem in the early game. And so while the Great Bombard health has been reduced to 300 from 350, and that their ranged armor has now been increased by 5, making them more vulnerable to ground units, their biggest nerf has actually been the Vizier experience uh, requirements for each level that has been increased now. So a massive tempo nerf to the Ottomans. Now, they start with the standard Vizier point um, timing. So 60 uh, experience uh, in the Vizier. The second one, which is the one that gives you the military school typically, now needs another 20. So it takes twice as long. Uh, sorry, not twice as long, but it takes 20 extra. And then for the third one, that would give you either Janissaries or faster military school production. So the third tier is now uh, also um, prolonged by another 30 experience points. So now we will see an Ottomans that can't get the Janissaries at their usual timing, making it a lot easier to push the Ottomans early on. So I would highly, highly recommend playing aggression now against the Ottomans. They will be a lot slower. The fourth one will be 240 instead of 200, and the last one is the same as the uh, initial one. The, the military production speed has been reduced from four 
0.5x to 5x the standard production rate. So it takes five times as long instead of four and a half times as long. So military schools also nerfed. Roofs, the hunting cabin, build time has been increased. So the early hunting cabin that you would get is now built at a slower pace. So you get your scout out a little bit later. Hunting cabin, build time has been increased from 25 to 35, 35 seconds. So probably you would want to make your second scout or rather your first produced scout um, in your TC. The Boyas Fortitude cost has been increased uh, from 100 food and 250 gold to 150 food and 350 gold. And they corrected a, an issue where horse archers would not retain the amount of precision bonuses that, when advancing to the next tier. All right, that's it for now. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and that you got a bit of insight on the new patch on Season 7 coming up. If you have any questions or any comments on the new patch, what do you think? Let me know down in the comment section below. I'll be there. And uh, yeah, good luck on the new season. Ciao, ciao.